Um, I'm Marco Bernazocchi. I'm the CEO of uh, OpenJS.ch, same company as Mario. Um, well, I'm going to skip those since I um, lost a bit of time. We're based in Switzerland. And this is what we do. Now, it might, say, might seem like advertisement, but I just want to point out two things. The major arguments that we are using on our leaflet is no vendor lock-in and control over whatever you do. And this is what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Um, first, a little step back. Open source, um, obviously you think, oh, no licenses. That's the first thing you think about when you think about open source. Um, open source has licenses, plenty of them. I have a little slide that I will skip uh, that shows you how many there are, but it's in there for you, so for reference, how many there are. And the uh, other major point you should be thinking about is when you think about free so software, it's, as Vanson already mentioned, it's not that you're not going to spend anything when you're using open source. On the other end, you will be spending, you probably will be spending less or you'll be spending differently, but there's just not going to be or probably not going to be licensing costs involved, but there are going to be costs involved and, and we're going to have a look a little bit into that. So I mentioned there are plenty of licenses. Um, I'm not going to teach you about all of this. It's a topic that is probably worth a full day of conferences. Uh, there are licenses that allow you to reuse things, to, to reuse and make business thi things out of it. There are licenses that force you to put things in the public, plenty of, way of different licenses. And um, there are so many that somebody actually had fun and made a uh, like a flowchart to decide what kind of license you want, um, you get the deck, and so you can go and have a look. Uh, some links um, for you when you get the deck. For the data, for data, a uh, little bit easier on the licenses. Creative Commons came up with a very interesting system to just go on a website and choose what you want people to allow to be doing with your data, and um, and then it tells you well that license would, would fit uh, ideally. Now, another very big misconception about open source. Whatever I'll do, I'll have to give it to the public. Well, that's the good thing that you should be doing and you should be giving back to your project. But you, unless some very specific license say that whatever you do with that, you need to make it public, your obligation to open source or to a license in open source is actually to respect the license. And if the license says you might use it for your own use, uh, you might use it for whatever you want, for business or not, and you want to keep your things in-house, do it. But think about that you are using work that a lot of other people have been investing in into before, and there is a lot of, you're, you're actually starting from 99% of the work done and you're just doing that 1% and there is a lot of work that has been done before that allows you to start that far already. So always, whenever you are using something in open source, think about, okay, uh, how can I give back? Is it financially? Is it by giving back code? Is it by giving uh, marketing power? Is it, there are so many ways to, to help, help open source. Just always keep kind of thinking about it. Now into, these are kind of the pre-messages to the presentation, um, into the core of the presentation. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Tansa perfectly already introduced the concept before. That's a very powerful marketing tactics. And here are actual quotes that I found on, uh, on this um, argument, why you should not be using open source. It's a lengthy, uh, um, it's a lengthy study, and um, it tells you all about um, open source and uh, and yeah. I'm gonna go through each point just for later on when you really are looking for some serious fun. Um, this YouTube video, uh, pretty spot on on how fear, uncertainty, and doubt is used in marketing against open source. First point: there is no support. Obviously. We are always sleeping, skiing, <laughs> running, 
that's usually where you find us. So we're never working. Uh, we pay bills just by magic. And um, yeah, first argument. Second one, obviously open source, it's only made in garages. And nobody knows about company that's were born in garages. So, uh, well, see, second point gone. In the commercial world, features follow commercial demand. If a paying customer, if as a paying customer you want a new feature, you contact your account manager or log a bug and you'll get an answer to whether and when you will get that feature. Um, okay, a couple of issues there. Um, whether and when. Uh, I'm paying you, I want it. Uh, no, you're not because you're not that relevant. You're a small customer. Um, again, we might be skiing, running or whatever um, and we're not going to be implementing whatever you ask us to do which might make our company be able to pay more uh, um, you know, um, more um, whatever vendors rigorously test their products before selling them obviously when you do not have a bug tracker open there are no bugs so you're all good huh? on QGIS we are very bad because we have so many bugs and we publish them Terrible, 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 never ever trust free, which would be the last point here. Uh, perhaps the biggest reason the largest e-commerce sites and web applications are deployed on commercial databases is the cost of failed transaction is simply too high to risk free. Never ever ever trust free. That's just the bottom line, you do not trust those kind of things, it's really bad. And that goes back to my first point, free as in freeware, has always had this negative thing of it's like you know the thing that they give you to give you a virus to it um, and free software is something very very different so yeah fear uncertainty and doubt very strong messages that get used always and always uh, you never get fired if you hire uh, if you use Oracle oh, I don't know now if we turn those things around why should you well we've seen first of all Direct access to code, you get control on whatever you build. Accelerated innovation, I mentioned, you start at 99, you don't start at zero. And you can actually look into what those 99% do, so that you can learn from it. So you're accelerating even more. Improve interoperability, open source is meant to be interoperable. So many different pieces that focus on doing one thing and one thing well, like we saw before with Proj, uh, specialize in something, make that, make it good. Another tool will come that will co-work with that. Going back to the bugs, obviously, superior code quality and security. Well, of course they don't have bugs, but we open up the code and multiple specialists external people can review it, can analyze it, can tell you, hey, here there is actually a bug. And finally, reduce cost and simplified operations. Um, just because you don't have licensing involved, you don't have to think about, uh, oh, uh, it's 7th of June, my licenses are expiring, uh, tomorrow my workers cannot work anymore. Technically. And then, actually, in the, in the previous slide, I had five reasons, five fear reasons. Here I put five and a half reason to use it because there is a very strong component. I'm putting it at a half and in brackets because I'm, I'm being a bit, um, how to say, a bit, uh, sorry, cautious? No, no, more like pointy, like uh, trying provocative. Thank you very much. I'm trying to provoke um, ethics. Who cares about ethics? But in open source, there is a very strong ethic component also. You're doing good. You're spending your money. Obviously, we all need to do business. So I need to pay Mario's salary. He won't be happy if I don't pay him the salary. So, uh, but as a super nice side effect, we are creating something that can be reused in, in a less fortunate place. So that's, to me, very, very strong point, but to be a bit pointy in brackets. Um, let's get a bit deeper in each of these points. Direct access to the code, obviously no lock-in. You want to go away from that software? Well, you know exactly what it was doing. You can just go away. Obviously it will cost you, like any migration, like Mario mentioned before, any migration will cost you. It will come with additional points, but you can. There's nobody that's going to be standing in your way to go away. 
on the other end, there might be somebody even happier to help you migrate away because they see what the actual tool was doing. Extendable, reusable, more agile, uh, flexibility. Um, you can test out things. You don't need to get a trial license that expires in 14 days, which you never even managed to install the thing in, first in, in the first 14 days because you got an important project to do. Um, so here you just have time to try out, to, to test, and so on. Oh, one more thing I forgot, the last point. Uh, putting the code directly in the hands of developers reduces the technical depth. So if you have an internal team of developers, it's usually for larger companies, well, they can keep up more with the code, with what's happening inside. So this was a quote by one of the biggest utilities companies in, in Holland in a conference I was last year. The most expensive developments are the ones you do yourself, so better not tie them to vendors. This is a company that is using a lot, a lot of proprietary um, code, um, solution, sorry, but they are integrating a lot with open source and everything they do themselves, they do it on open source, so that they say everything that glues everything else together, we need control on it, we need to be fast, we need to, to be able to make it grow faster, so um, we like to do our own custom solutions. Um, improved interoperability, as I mentioned, open source is meant to be interoperable, open standards, um, it, can well, it can play well, mainly uh, open source tool, or mostly open source tool, work well with proprietary tool, the other way around, not always the case. Um, imagine the possibilities and efficiencies to be gained from the ability to connect and share data across platforms. As um, Vincent mentioned before, sometimes you have a system that is running um, that doesn't make sense to just upgrade that, but you much rather build new things uh, on the side and then eventually, if needed, you migrate or not, but by cooperate, making system cooperate, you're probably gaining much more than just staying in one black box. I'm sorry about the, that's, uh, it's reformatted my not full at all slides. Um, vast growing community, so I mentioned before, security and quality of the code. A mature product usually has a mature community behind it, so it means that there are plenty of people reviewing the code, looking at it with di very different critical eyes, very different approaches, and here is where open source can also be, be very, very attractive. Um, academia uh, very often uh, prouds themselves when they can find very difficult bugs, so all these kind of things happen, uh, can happen very well in in open source. Cost and simplified operations, I mentioned before, um, well, you don't have licensing in play or, or much of the time you don't have licenses in place, so you don't have this problem with having to, to deal with them, you don't have the problem that if suddenly you have a hundred people going on the field to digitize data, um, with a proprietary solution, you need to have a hundred digitizer licenses, where with open source you can scale much better. Um, yeah. Then, um, I mentioned FOSS uh, FOS software does not mean there are no costs involved. We've seen before training, consulting, migrations, all that, all those kind of costs exist. They, they are everywhere um, in every solution. You, you get a proprietary solution, you get an open source solution, you will have those kind of costs. So um, the only cost that most of the time falls away is the licensing cost, which might be a very major cost, but, uh, but that's, that's the one that will fall away. And then ethics, obviously, um, if you write something super cool and you share it, ma many people will be able to learn out of it and they, um, they, they will be improving it and hopefully give it back and, and the whole thing grows much faster. If we look at the development rate in QGIS in the last three years, uh, yesterday I gave a talk um, and 
uh, I went through the change logs from version 2.18 to 3.8, which is about two years of development, I guess, two and a half maybe. And just getting the one-liner titles of the features, it was uh, like a 600 or 700 lines document. And I was like, I need to make a 20 minutes presentation out of this. And <coughs> it was a bit tricky, but got there. So it's a very, very, it, it just accelerate uh, extremely. So take home uh, points about why uh, FOSGIS flexibility, no lock-in, control, speed of development, ability to influence a project, cost sharing, scalability, and reuse instead of reinventing. New aspects with uh, free software, well, um, project versus product. So very often you're involved with a project and not with a product, so it's a little bit different. Power users should usually invest in those projects. So if you are saving a million or a hundred thousand in license, well, you could give back 10,000 to that project, which is making you save so much money. Or you could just give back two days a week of uh, one of your internal developers. So there are so many ways that uh, companies can, can use to give back. Um, Free software users have more responsibility in the sense that, well, obviously when you buy a license, you buy to get rid of every pro possible problem you have. That's at least what the box says. Um, with open source, obviously nobody's going to help you because they are skiing or running or whatever they, they are doing. Um, but this can obviously be mitigated by company that make their living out of supporting and enhancing open source like uh, we see with Oslandia or with ourselves. At times, we do have different support channels and I'll go into it uh, with the last three slides. Um, just, well, I'm gonna skip this. Costs, uh, we saw this as well, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, will I be alone? Well, no. There are huge projects that are running on open source, actually the internet. Uh, the little black box thingy um, where we all go and ask questions. It's running basically currently, I guess, about 70% on open source servers. So uh, nowadays, if you are doing some administration thing, you know Docker, you know Kubernetes, TensorFlow, Nginx, Apache, it's like huge. They are everywhere. We just never think about it, but the internet is basically just running on, on open source. Uh, just recently, Microsoft bought GitHub for seven and a half billions, and IBM bought Red Hat for 34 billions. Um, so there must be some interest in open source somewhere, because I mean, I, I don't know, I, my company cannot just give out 34 billions uh, like that. Um, I mentioned support before. Uh, there are my last three slides, so. How do you mitigate the fact of not having a selling partner? Well, with support companies. Or with community support, which is free, non-binding. It means, well, you can ask on a mailing list, on a forum, um, on whatever channel, on Stack Overflow, and you might get an answer. But don't get angry if you don't get an answer, because that's just people giving their free time for you, and it is much easier when you are asking questions about sexy features, so like uh, cool things that people like to develop or that maybe they even do it for free. Cool, if it happens. If not, commercial support. We make our living out of it. One shot, well, we need a custom development. We need teaching, we need consulting, we need a migration, we need an installation. Fair enough, can do that. Or nicer uh, long-term support. And here we are answering directly the, the issue of, well, who's going to help me if there is problem? Well, we'll do. Uh, Vincent will. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's very important message that we need to, and we need all people that are using open source also to communicate to the world that uh, there are a lot of companies that are here just to help you support, that have support contracts, that have, uh, uh, initiative, sustainability initiative. So pff, there are plenty of models out there. Every company has a bit their own contract. Uh, talk to them. Talk to the company you are working with, and, and tell them, look, we we like working with you. Can we set up support contracts? And maybe 
Can we put as part of the support contract that you also do some bug fixing upstream in the project that we are actually heavily using? It's a, that's what the sustainability initiative is that we have. So hope um, gave you a bit of thinking matter, so a little bit of, of ideas, of uh, arguments to, to go back to your bosses and tell them open source is even better than I thought. And if you have any question, thanks a lot. Time for those who've got several billion in the bank who want to find out how to donate. To I have Swiss banks account <laughs> as well. Uh, you know, if there's any questions from the floor. Not necessarily a question, but just like another thing that you should point out on the slide is uh, most of the companies that buy, my company is one, usually take proprietary software and they customize the hell out of it. So it doesn't even resemble the original proprietary product. And then you get, you, you get double luck. So not just the software, but also the customization. And if you want to go to somebody else, it's like, hey, did you do this and that and this and that? It's like, no, because I don't know what's behind there. So you start both with the software and the development team that is originally implemented the product. So it's, it's a double logic. And nobody supports it. Um, so basically, uh, by taking a proprietary software and then developing on top of it, uh, you're locking in doubly because you're locking into the original software and to development team that developed the whole thing. Because when, if you want to move away and show it to somebody else, you cannot because you are not allowed to uh, share the code. Yeah, short message lock-in is very bad <laughs> and very costly. <laughs> More questions? Thank you very much. So I should ask two questions. <laughs> uh, I was working in one project in a developing country and it was exactly the same thing. Uh, I was trying to figure out where, okay, why they are using the commercial products in these projects while op open source uh, solutions are available. And there are always political motives behind it. So they are getting fundings from international donors and with some compliance that they should use the proprietary software as well. So this is one of the reason, as per my own personal experience, we have done double lock or maybe political lock that uh, people can't uh, use the software afterwards. I'm sure I left this project 10 years ago, it should be dead now because nobody is going to uh, use it. Uh, the second thing is that I have been trying to find it out. The biggest problem which uh, to motivate the people to come towards the open source, and particularly the young ones, is training about how the open source world works, particularly from the business point of view, from the business model point of view, how they should uh, start it. My question is that, is there any way out or any any source which you could mention that uh, where we could learn about the current business trends or business models, how we should gen prepare our business model, how we could charge our customers and the products as well. This would be very good. Thank you. So to the first point, well, international donors, I think, are getting more and more sensitive to the open source world. So there is definitely a movement in that direction mainly because of the scaling of the licenses and as you say a locked-in project uh, will die eventually when there is no more donor money involved so i've been working a bit with donors and you see that kind of open source uh, requirements popping up more and more and to the second point um, there is not much i'm with absolutely with you that's why i i start i decided to do this talk and that's why i give every year at the University of Zurich, uh, um, a small guest lecture about business, uh, about open source and entrepreneurship. I think there, it has to come from people like me that that go out and and try to teach and tell young developers how much cooler it is to to develop this way because uh, to me it's just a completely different world. So it's uh, it's much much better. But there are not many. Um, resources about that. No, it's a. Uh, yeah. 
can I just make some shameless uh, advertisement? Come to my talk later on um, at at five. I will explain not the business side, but the organizational side of uh, running an open source company. So just one general topic that was uh, maybe slightly overlooked is the topic of documentation. So in terms of official documentation, I think that um, proprietary software is winning. <laughs> uh, and that's, I think, because they put much more resources than the open source community. And so the question is essentially, how do you um, ensure that do you have some kind of documentation efforts in place? Because I think this is for my company uh, is the biggest challenge for Implement. So documentation is... Um it's a tricky business, um, not tricky business, it's a tricky thing uh, because it's difficult to make, it uh, expires very quickly, and it's time consuming and developers do not like to do it. So we have a very nice combination to have very good um, uh, documentation. In QGIS actually we have started efforts to do, beside the paid bug fixing, um, ongoing program, we have a paid documentation ongoing program. Because we realize that, uh, that that's a point uh, that is not at the point that we would like it to be. It's the software is here, documentation is here, it's a pain, it's a pity. But uh, it's something we are working on, at least in QGIS, which is the ecosystem I know best, and I'm sure that other, um, other um, projects will, will, uh, will do their own. They will realize eventually, because it's something you need to realize that uh, it's very important. Yes. So um, I also also will also comment that actually not all open source projects are bad at documentation. For example, GDAL, we saw they've got very good documentation. GeoServer, which I've been to some of their talks, I think they've got pretty good documentation. So there are actually quite a few that document themselves document themselves well. Coming from the QGIS community, we kind of made us our lives difficult because we translate our documentation. Really. I think the others all do it in English, and because of that, we created such a difficult workflow. Uh, for people to um, participate in the documentation effort that it made it difficult for people like yourself to just walk up and add a paragraph or something like that. But we really do care about it and we are trying to improve the situation. Just one more comment from Vincent. Yeah, I'm going to add as well as uh, as a client or a funder for a uh, for 4D project, you also have the responsibility to require a, a new feature being developed, but also uh, the uh, documentation we comes along. And so every time you uh, order a new feature, you should ask specifically for test documentation and overall quality. But some do not do that because they want to have the feature less expensive and uh, they shouldn't because on the long run it's bad for the project. And it's also our responsibility as service provider to say to them, no, you have to pay for documentation as well. Yeah. I think the difference is that GeoServer has excellent official documentation, right? But QJS does not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. 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 Finish your sentence as I get there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we need to wrap up this session. Thank you very much and thank you to the speakers. Thank you.